Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about solutions. And typically in chemistry, you think about liquid solutions, but the solutions don't have to be just liquid, right? So solutions usually are homogeneous or homogeneous. Mixtures of liquids. That's what we typically think of, but it could involve solids or gases. So you, of course, can put a solid right inside of a liquid and make a solution. And that's mostly what we'll talk about today. We'll also talk about taking one liquid and pouring a second liquid into the first liquid. So that would be a liquid liquid solution. But you can also have gases, and this is probably the one you don't think much about, but you can put a gas inside this liquid to make a solution, or you can take one gas molecule, maybe it's oxygen, and add it to another gas molecule, nitrogen, and now you have a homogeneous mixture of gases, and this is what we call air. So these are all solutions. It's when there's this, you know, equal, uh, uniform throughout uh, composition of this mixture of liquids, solids, or gases. So what we're going to talk about today is defining each of these terms, thinking about what governs when gases go into the liquid, when one liquid will go into another liquid, and primarily today when perhaps this solid will go into a liquid. So let's define some terms here. Solutions, right? As we talked about previously, homogeneous mixture of two or more pure substances. Okay, again, a pure substance is you know a uh, element by itself, like nitrogen, nitrogen gas, uh, or it could be a compound that is pure, like water. Right? It's not already some kind of mixture that you're mixing with something else. Okay, it's a homogeneous mixture of two or more pure substances. Uh, in a solution, right? Now that you've made this mixture. There's going to be solute and solvent, and there could be more than one solute. Okay, so there, there could be multiple solutes. The solvent is, first I'll, I'll finish this, could be multiple. Uh, these are less than They're present in quantities less than solvent. Okay, so in a solution, you have this vocabulary of the thing that's most of the solution Maybe you could think of this as the majority member, where the solute is the minority member or members. Okay, so there could be multiple solutes, but these are present in quantities that are less than the solvent, right? Where the solvent, most of the solution is the solvent, okay? So think about, you know, salt water, there's a little bit of salt, the solute, in the water, the solvent, together that makes salt water the solution. And what we want to think about today is being able to really picture in our minds what governs whether a substance will form solutions when they mix. Why, when you pour oil and water, do they not mix? Why, when you put salt in water, does it mix and dissolve? Okay, and actually, this is really a balance. And this is something we talk a lot about in chemistry, you know, throughout various courses. It's the balance of these two things right here. This natural tendency towards mixing, okay, that we will call delta S. Don't worry about it for now, but that's our abbreviation for it. That's entropy. and Intermolecular forces that we'll talk about today, that is really enthalpy dot delta H. Okay, and it turns out as we progress in this semester, we'll get to a formula that, that looks like this. And this delta G here is what's governing really whether anything happens in nature. You look at this delta G, and it's always a balance of entropy and enthalpy or energy. Okay, so not super important to remember these formulas for now, but I'd like to introduce it here because it really is the first time in this course 
uh, that we're talking about this balance between energy, which we're really familiar with, and entropy, which is kind of unclear at this point. So with this vocabulary in mind, let's think about the energy part or the enthalpy part, these intermolecular forces, right? Why are substances going to mix and form a solution? Well, it depends on these energetic forces. Okay, in this part, you can think about, you know, magnets where certain forces draw things together, other forces push things apart. And here we're concerning ourselves with intermolecular forces. And if you're not sure about the different intermolecular forces, I'll highlight them here, but there's a whole bunch of videos on my channel uh, dedicated to intermolecular forces. So go back and give those a watch. Here's the usual intermolecular forces we talk about. Okay, dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bond, or ion dipole. And these first couple here are usually grouped together and called uh, van der Waals forces. Dispersion, everything has dispersion forces. And the dispersion forces, think about the electrons being in like a cloud around this molecule, okay? And that cloud is what's called polarizable. You can push it back and forth. And so imagine you push all the electrons in this one molecule onto the left side. Well, then the right side is positive. And well, now all the electrons in molecule two, well, their electrons are gonna be attracted to this positive side. And so that's the net sort of force of attraction. That's the dispersion force. Just the fact that these electron clouds are polarizable. Again, I'm going over this quick because, well, there's a whole bunch of videos on these topics on my channel. So that's dispersion. Uh, dipole, dipole, dipole force is not this really fleeting pushing around electrons, but something permanent, okay? So here's acetonitrile. There's a carbon up here. There's a nitrogen down here. Nitrogen is more electronegative. There is always more negative charge on this side of the acetonitrile molecule versus this. And so this is a permanent sort of separation of charge here. So it's not this fleeting thing like dispersion, but it's still this attraction between negative and positive. Hydrogen bond is just a special type of dipole-dipole. Here you get a proton that is uh, out here on hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen is one proton and one electron orbiting it. But if fluorine's really electronegative, that electron really lives near fluorine. And so what happens is this hydrogen basically loses its electron. And so now you're just talking about a proton out here, kind of like this positive charge, but this is no electrons around, just a proton. So this is an even stronger form of this positive charge here. And so it's able to really interact and attract these negative electrons. And so that attraction, again, between negative and positive, that's the force right here. That's the hydrogen bond. The last is ion dipole. And just like hydrogen was kind of a slightly stronger dipole dipole, this is a slightly stronger version of the hydrogen bond. And why is that? Well, where here we had this sort of hydrogen that looked like just a proton, okay, it still had access to fluorine's electrons. So while it was mostly a positive charge, it wasn't a total positive charge like a sodium ion has a total net positive charge. So this is an even bigger plus that's being attracted to this minus. And so again, the larger you make these pluses or minuses, the stronger the force. And so going left to right here, these forces get stronger. Now, any intermolecular force of attraction can be the attraction between solute and solvent molecules. So maybe the solution, right, if we're talking about solute and solvent, are these things going to mix? Here is the key point. You have to worry about the intermolecular forces within the solvent and within the solute and what forces there would be when solute mixes with solvent. So that's what we're trying to think about. What are the intermolecular forces of attraction when we mix the things together? Okay, and we might have to, if the solvent is acetonitrile, we will have to break this force, right? That's gonna cost some energy or enthalpy. So if we wanna break this apart to fit some other molecule in between, we have to overcome energy, and we're only gonna do that if, if the energy we get out is beneficial. Okay, so let's look at this at sort of a more molecular level. Here's sodium chloride, right? This is the cubic structure, roughly, of sodium chloride. The green here are sodiums, the red here are chlorines, and you get this periodic crystal structure. 
of sodium and chlorine stacking together. And this is a salt cube. Now, when you put this in water, let's think about the glass of water. Well, this glass of water, maybe we'll look at it up here and then we'll break it out down below. Here's a glass of water. Now, inside this water, what kind of forces are there? Well, there are waters in here, and these waters will have hydrogen bonding forces. Okay, so here is one force. that I'm going to have to overcome if I'm going to put this salt inside the water. And so we better get out some more beneficial forces. So in water, there is a hydrogen bond. There is this sort of force, right? So hydrogen bond, we'll put this here, that's water. Now, imagine I take this water and now it lives near to this sodium chloride. So I'm putting the sodium chloride inside the water. Okay, well this water molecule now sees this sodium plus right here. And it says to the sodium plus, well, I'm a water molecule. That looks like it could be an ion dipole force between some electrons on my oxygen and the positive sodium atom, right? So that's like what we're talking about here. We can get an ion dipole force. This can be attracted to the water molecule. Here it was shown with acetonitrile, but the same can be true for a water molecule. There's still going to be this net attraction here developing, right? That's what I'm showing here. This is the force. And this ion dipole force can be stronger than this hydrogen bonding force, right? So that's a hydrogen bond, whereas that's ion dipole. But something additional happens as well. The additional thing that happens is, well, it's not just sodiums here, there's a chlorine, and this chlorine is a negative charge, but water can still benefit from that interaction because a water molecule down here can say, well, my hydrogen is basically a bare proton, and here is another ion dipole force. So here's another ion dipole force that's able to develop. So. The first few waters, as you plug this sodium chloride into your water, the first couple waters might be able to peel off these ion dipole forces and peel off the ions. And now look, it's missing here and here. So you just keep doing this. Now the next water can come in and maybe it has access, right, to this chlorine, right? Whereas before the water was preoccupied with this chlorine, but now there's the next water that can come in here with its hydrogen atom oriented here and attract this chlorine. Okay, so this is the dissolving or dissolution process. You're slowly picking off these ions one by one and dissolving this sodium chloride so that at the end, you don't have any sort of crystal structure anymore, but all you have here is a bunch of waters and a bunch of ions. And even more specifically, what really tips the scales is that these sodiums, like we're showing here, that are attracted to these oxygens, well, I can actually get, since I have a solvent and there's a lot of these waters around here, I can actually get a whole bunch of waters oriented around this sodium. Here's four. So for this one sodium ion, I can have one, two, three, four of these strong ion dipole forces. Now, I did have to sacrifice something, right? I no longer have a hydrogen bond set up maybe between these two waters, but that's okay because now I'm getting out a whole bunch of ion dipole forces. I also had to sacrifice this, you know, sodium chlorine attraction, this ionic bond. For salt and water, you have to compare those forces. And so the net effect for salt and water is that these are more beneficial than this plus each of these 
ionic bonds. And so in the end, as long as you get a bunch of forces out here, don't forget about the chlorines, right? Each one of these has a bunch of hydrogen ends of waters oriented at it. Those forces are all beneficial too. As long as those outbalance all the ionic bonding and all the hydrogen bonding amongst the solvent, then it's a net win and you will dissolve. So that's the energetics of solution formation. It's all about what are the forces you're getting out in intermolecular forces for the solute, sodium and chlorine, versus solvent, water, formation, energetics. So we sort of summed this up on the previous slide walking through it, but the solute-solute interactions must be overcome to disperse the particles when making a solution, right? Those in our previous slide, these were the ionic bonds of sodium chloride. That's what we have to overcome. Solvent-solvent interactions, well, that was water-hydrogen bonding. That must be overcome. So all of those things must be overcome, and the only thing you have to overcome them is solvent-solute interactions, right? So these are the ion-dipole forces in our previous example. But this is broadly applicable, right? This is not just salt and water, right? But any solution that might form. You can look at this graphically here, exothermic versus endothermic, right? This tells you what is the net energy effect. And so what we're looking at here is a enthalpy scale, right? So this is my initial, okay? So initially, I have some solvent here, so this is my glass of water. And my solute here is my periodic crystal lattice of sodium and chlorine. Chlorine. Okay? I have to break all the water molecules apart, overcome hydrogen bonding. That costs me some energy, so I go up on the energy scale. I have to break apart all the sodium and chlorides. That's going to take some energy. If I add up those two energies, this is how much it costs me to break apart the solute and the solvent. The energy I get returned, this red arrow here, this is the ion dipole forces in the previous example. Although it doesn't have to be ion dipole, it could be any type of force. As long as that force is greater than the forces you're having to overcome, that will be exothermic. Okay, so this particular one is exothermic. Now, you could imagine, right, if the forces you're setting up are dispersion forces and much weaker, right, well, maybe the arrow is only this long. And so your final amount of enthalpy is up here. That would be a net loss of energy. Delta H would be greater than zero because final is greater than initial. Right? So it depends on the type of forces you're getting when you mix them relative to the forces you have to overcome where this final versus initial is, which is delta H overall. So that would be endothermic there, but this as written and as drawn is exothermic because I get more energy out at the end. This arrow is longer. Ion dipole forces are more energetic. There's a bigger change in energy upon mixing them. Then it costs me energy to break all of them apart. and so. Final is less than initial, so H final minus H initial means my H solution is less than zero and exothermic. That's what's shown in this figure. But you can draw another figure for endothermic, and I would challenge you to do so to make sure you understand this. Now, one last point that we hinted at at the start. This is only an energy argument. Most of the time, we can look at something like this and say, as long as it's exothermic, right, a solution will form. And you might be tempted to say, if it's endothermic, a solution won't form. And while usually you'd be right, it's not always, okay? Because whether a solution forms is a balance of what we're talking about here, energy and entropy. And we're not really talking about this entropy of mixing factor just yet in this course. For now, let's master the energetic components, also known as enthalpy. And we can predict most of the time if it's exothermic, final less than initial, 
then we're going to get a solution. If the opposite is true, we probably won't get a solution. So let's maybe pause here and think about this question for 30 seconds. Try to answer it on your own, and then I'll go through and answer it afterwards. So time is up. Let's think about this on our previous diagram. When sodium hydroxide dissolves, the container becomes hot. Okay, so let's think about this in terms of this diagram, right? What we're doing now is putting this solute sodium hydroxide into the water, okay? We must overcome these, we must overcome these. When we do that, the container becomes hot. So this means, if it's hot to the touch, that means energy is leaving this system. There was an excess of energy in the system, okay? And so as we mix these two things together, this arrow, right, must be longer than this arrow. Why? Because upon mixing, there must be extra energy here that can be given off, right? This is delta H solution less than zero. It's why we call things exothermic, right? It's why we call things exothermic when they're giving off energy to the surroundings. So the answer here should be B, the solute plus the solvent must be less than delta H mixing. Uh, exactly what we're showing here in this previous slide, the arrow for delta H mix is longer. This leads to my exothermic case which means heat is given off, okay? Now, if the container became cold, the opposite would be true. And if it's cold to the touch, that means the system, that mixture is absorbing heat from you and from the surroundings, okay? But because it became hot here, I know it's less than delta H mixing and the answer here should be B, okay? Mixing is the process of pouring them together. Right, this right here, these are the intermolecular forces you're creating. These two, right, so the red arrow are the intermolecular forces you're creating. These are the intermolecular forces you're overcoming. Okay, so in our previous example of, say, sodium chloride, right, and water, we have to overcome ionic bonds to break apart all this sodium chloride. We have to overcome hydrogen bonds of the water-water. We have to separate all these things so that when we put them back together and create all these ion dipole forces, right, as long as those are more favorable overall, then all the work we have to do to break apart the water-hydrogen bonds to break apart the ionic bonds. As long as this arrow is greater, right, then we'll make a solution. It'll be exothermic. We're getting out, you know, better intermolecular forces, ion dipole, compared to the hydrogen bonding and uh, ionic bonds. Um, I will caution you not to always assume ion dipole is stronger than hydrogen bonding. Right? It's not always going to be the case that just because you're making ion dipole forces that it's going to be uh, exothermic and it's going to form a solution. That's not always going to be the case. Right? I'm just using this here to illustrate that all of these ion dipole forces, which are stronger than hydrogen bonds anyway, that all adds up to a more beneficial force in the end. Otherwise, the salt would just stay clumped together and not fall apart in water. Right? There's this natural tendency for it to do so because you're lowering the energy overall, H final less than H initial. 
One other thing I want you to be careful about is this idea that a chemical reaction has or hasn't happened when something dissolves. So just because a substance disappears when it comes in contact doesn't mean, you know, it dissolved. Uh, it could go through a chemical reaction. So this goes both ways, right? When you put salt, okay, here's uh, your water on the stove, and this is a lesson if you're cooking. If you're cooking pasta, always put some sodium chloride salt in your pasta water. It'll flavor the pasta. It also changed the boiling point, as we'll see in future lectures, and that helps too. Anyways, for flavor, always salt your pasta water, right? Whatever you're cooking in this water, it'll flavor the thing you're, you're cooking with. But what you'll see is that you didn't cause a chemical reaction here, and you'll notice this because at the end, when you pour out all this water, you will have this little bit of residue because you poured in more sodium chloride than you know, really was necessary to flavor your food. So there's a little bit of sodium chloride that, you know, forms a residual at the bottom of your pot. And you'll see this if you boil all the water away, right, and get rid of all the H2O from boiling, you'll be left with this salt on the bottom of your pan or of your pot, okay? So you can recover, right, this sodium chloride. So this dissolution that we're talking about here in the previous slides is really just a physical change, okay? The solvent can be evaporated to recover the solute, and you'll see that in your, you know, pasta water if you boil out all the water. Now, that's not always going to be the case. When you pour nickel in hydrochloric acid, don't cook with this stuff, by the way, uh, but when you put nickel in hydrochloric acid, okay, the substance disappears. Does that mean all the nickel, right, was in this crystal lattice and just went into the HCl? And the answer is no, and it's no because if you evaporate all this HCl and remove it, you don't get this nickel back out again. You get this nickel chloride back out. So you have to be careful with just because something disappears doesn't mean it dissolved, okay? It could have undergone a chemical reaction. The difference is remove the solvent. Do you get the solute back out? If the answer is yes, it was a physical change. If the answer is no, then it's a chemical change. Now, these processes of uh, dissolving or evaporating the solvent back out, known as crystallization, are not competing, but they're opposing processes. Okay, so this, this dissolution we've been talking about, or this dissolving, is really this forward process of making a solution. But everything in chemistry is really a two-way street. So there's this opposite crystallization, right? Out of this solution, you can separate the solute and the solvent. You can crystallize out that solute. These two things actually are happening at opposite, are, are happening, uh, you know, at the same time in both directions. So, you know, while I showed back here that you're really picking off these sodium and chlorines one by one with the water molecules, right? What you'll also see is that Every once in a while, this sodium up here, right, maybe is migrating down and meets up with the chlorine. And when it does, you can recrystallize sodium chloride, right? It does happen, okay? It's just when it does, it might immediately fall back apart. There's always these competing processes of crystallization, right, and dissolution where the waters are peeling apart these ions. And it's just whether the forward or reverse is happening much more, where the equilibrium lies, whether it is a solution or it's crystallized out. So when the rate of the opposing processes is equal, uh, more solute doesn't dissolve unless some other place, it crystallizes out. And this is a saturated solution. So imagine you keep pouring salt in your water and keep pouring salt and keep pouring salt. You know, at some point, you've created so much sodium and chlorine in your water that they can't help but bump into one another more often and crystallize. And so at that point that you can't pour any more and get it to go into the water, that's called a saturated solution. Okay, if you're not there yet, it's unsaturated. And so in most of your experiences, you're gonna be working with unsaturated solutions. You add a little bit of salt to water when you're cooking pasta, it's unsaturated at that point. Right? But sometimes in chemistry, you will be able to create a saturated solution where you, you know, continue to pour this solid into the liquid uh, and it doesn't dissolve. You can stir, doesn't matter. It's saturated at that point.
there's also this sort of uh you know special type of solution where maybe you change the temperature and the solubility is a function of temperature maybe you can actually get the solvent to hold more solute than is normally possible at that temperature and this is known as super saturated so you can use temperature or something to uh, shift the equilibrium and then lower the temperature back down and create what's really a meta stable state kind of uh it's not super happy but it needs some sort of trigger to return to equilibrium that is this super saturated state so super saturated means you know the solvent has more of this solute dissolved in it than should be possible uh, and you've changed temperature or pressure to to be able to do this that's known as super saturated and these are really cool fun solutions because a lot of times you can trigger the crystallization all at once another practice problem let's take 30 seconds here and try to answer this one here's a solubility and now we're getting into the units of these things here's the solubility of potassium chloride what type of solution is this Okay, time is up. Now, this is a question that, you know, a lot of students read and, and immediately get scared of because there looks like there's a lot of math going on here, right? But there's, there's really not. Uh, the solubility of KCL is 34 grams per 100 milliliters of water. Okay, so this solubility makes a saturated solution. So that's the point we have to know here that this is a saturated solution. So you know, if you were asking the question, how many grams of potassium chloride form a saturated solution in 100 milliliters of water? It is 34 grams. So if I take 0.1 liters, well, that's silly. That's just 100 milliliters. I'll do the conversion. It contains 29.2. Where does that relate to here? So if 34 is saturated, 29.2. Is less than that so it's unsaturated okay if it was 39.2 that would be super saturated okay so this one should be unsaturated it is below the amount that fits at equilibrium and 100 milliliters of water so uh, that covers some basics of solution including solubility in terms of saturated and unsaturated, the intermolecular forces at play here, and importantly, this picture of this balance of intermolecular forces uh, that we have to take, you know, uh, we have to take into account to figure out, is it endothermic? Is it exothermic? Will it dissolve? Will it not dissolve? It depends on all these forces uh, that we have to balance. So uh, with that, that will do it in this lecture. Uh, up next time, we of course move on and think about what affects a gas solubility in a liquid? Here we're talking mostly about a solute solid going into a solvent, but let's think more about in the future lectures what happens with gases and liquids, uh, as well as talking about sort of metrics of solutions and how we measure things like molarity and parts per million, parts per million, uh, molality, mass percents, et cetera. How do we express these things quantitatively? So that's coming up in the next lecture. For now, that'll do it for this one, and I'll see you next time.